Hello, and welcome to this month's Simon Says Expert Series. I'm Stephanie Rufenbarger Lesher. I'm the VP of Development at the Catherine Peachy Fund. And I am thrilled that Dr. Hari Nakshatri is our presenter today. I suspect that he's a familiar face for many of you who have joined today. Although he does spend most of his time behind the scenes working hard in his lab doing breast cancer research. He's recognized nationally for his expertise in breast cancer research, having recently contributed another important finding. He and his team identified a new target for breast cancer treatment. That discovery was made by using healthy breast tissue cells from the unique Komen Tissue Bank at the IU Simon, cancer Compre IU Simon Comprehensive Cancer Center. It's just one of many other findings that Hari has contributed to making advances against this disease. Today, he is going to share with us other achievements that have been discovered thanks to those who have donated to the Komen Tissue Bank. Hari? Thanks, Stephanie. And thank you for asking me to present today. And before I start anything, I would like to first thank more than 6,000 women who donated the breast tissue for this bank and countless number of volunteers who helped this uh, help to collect the breast tissues and of course number of donors who helped us to do this. So what I thought of to to set the stage for discussion at the end, I will briefly present some of the ideas that has come out of the common tissue bank work over the years and set the stage and then start taking some questions from you. I hope I'm presenting in a way that it's not too complicated, but we can discuss this later in the end. So this is what I'm going to talk to you today. What healthy breast tissues teach us? Lessons from the common tissue bank. The, there is some technique, okay, here you go. So this is the, the tissue bank that we have. At the moment, we have more than 5,035 women who are donated the breast tissue who are clinically breast cancer free at the time of collection. And recently, we started collecting the breast tissue from men. 30, more than 30 men have donated the breast tissue. This is not a simple procedure. You have to use ultrasound guided biopsies to collect them. And we also have two unique set of samples, those who donated the breast tissue twice, so most of the time 10 years apart, and those who subsequently developed breast cancer after, the, after their donation. They are important resources, which only IU, Simon Cancer Center, or KTB has them. There are 89 publications that have come out of using the tissues from uh, uh, the Common Tissue Bank. They came out in high impact journals, Nature, Nature Communications and Genetics, etc. And we have started a clinical trial at IUSCC based on the tissue, the data we generated using Common Tissue Bank. I'll come back to this point later on, providing you more details. And the, not only us were using these tissues, it has gone out the global investigators, more than 200 investigators have used this tissue for their research. So the question in many of your mind, why is it so important? Let me put it in a context why it is so important for us to study the normal breast tissue. If you think that the breast cancer that is diagnosed in the clinic started a few months ago or few, even a few years ago, we are wrong. In fact, re a recent study showed that at least in 20% of breast cancer, the very first lesion that led to the breast cancer, which was diagnosed at the age of 40 or 50 years, that lesion can happen in a person when they are six years old. So as they progress, they, these cells in the breast, which has this mutation that started the cancer progress path, they remain like normal all the way up to 20 or 30 years of age. Then these particular additional mutations happen, then they start becoming a cancer and it gets diagnosed at the age of 40 or 50 years. So most of the researchers till the KTB came about 
had access to these tissues, but none had the tissues at this stage. So how can you study this initial process of breast cancer initiation without knowing what, how exactly the normal breast looks like? That is the place where KDB came into play and that's why it has become a, one of the world renowned uh, the repository for the normal breast tissue. Let me put the cancer in a very simple context. Again, here is a healthy cell. The first mutation happens. These healthy cells can divide only to a certain number of times, very limited number of times. But when that control is lost, what we call as hyperplasia or the initial step that happens, then the additional mutations happen, then the tumor comes out. Again, as I pointed out, resources existed before KDB to study this tumor, a very little to this level, but none at this stage. And these process from healthy to come up to this tumor goes through many, many years. It takes multiple steps. So with this background, what I'm going to discuss today are the accomplished by the res researchers using the KDB samples. And I will spend quite a bit of time what we have done, in particularly developing what we call single cell breast atlas. The third aspect, which has been uh, our major focus has been to uh, whether we can use the samples from KDB to understand breast cancer disparity. I will come to that point in a minute uh, in more detail. I'll briefly touch on a clinical trial that we are initiating based on the studies. And what have we learned from breast tissues of men. Although we started collecting breast tissues from men in last November, we have made already a significant progress with the limited tissues that we have. I will touch upon it at the very end. So overview of research accomplishment, addressing biologic basis of disparity, why certain uh, people of certain genetic ancestry have worst outcome. We created the single cell atlas of the breast and the rest of these here are done by the investigators from the other institution. There is a, they have elucidated a correlation between breast involution, density, and breast cancer risk. Involution means during the pregnancy and after lactation, the, uh, after the, the, if is the, after breastfeeding is done, the breast has to return back to normal. If at all, if it fails to come back to normal, does it have increased the risk for breast cancer? That analysis were done using the uh, common normal tissue bank. Breast cancer initiation and the risk that has been done. And it has opened the pathway for breast cancer prevention vaccine. Here, what you know, the other investigators have done is to figure out what are the immune cells that are the guardian against any disease in the normal breast in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutant, mutation carrying individuals, as well as those who have chronic inflammation. From that, they have been identifying the immune cells that are different under the condition. There are early indication or early steps to use that knowledge to develop the prevention vaccine. Then the resources that we have given out to others enable many researchers, including my own group, to attract a lot of breast cancer funding. Then the number keeps growing. It's more than 25 million to date. And also these tissues have been used by young investigators. More than 23 in junior investigators are trained using this tissue in different disciplines like epidemiology and the simple molecular biology. So this is the impact beyond our institution on the KTB is having. Let me diagrammatically show what exactly we are focused on. This is how the mammography looks like. And if you look into the normal breast, this is the lobule. This is where the milk is made. This is the duct from which the milk comes out. And most of the cancers are within this duct. And there is this unique type of cancer coming out from the lobule called lobular carcinoma, but most of them come here. If you dissect this into half, look under microscope, this is what a normal breast duct would look like. There's a layer of cells here. There are layer of cells here. 
and the inside it is hollow lumen. That's where the milk gets secreted, milk comes out. Most of the cancers originate from these cells. The initial step, instead of being hollow, they get filled up with the cells. These cells are destined to die otherwise, but they fail to die. They start proliferating. That is called DCIS. Now, instead of staying within the duct, when they start invading outside, then they became invasive carcinoma of the breast. Then if they not only invade within the breast, but they start getting to the bloodstream or lymphatic system to go to the other part of the body, that's what we call metastatic breast cancer. The one simple question my lab has been asking for many years, to what extent normal breast epithelial are phenotypically similar between individuals? I will explain that point in a minute in much more detail. First, how many cell types exist in the breast? How many of these cell types are prone for breast cancer? And then the question we ask, do these cell types show differences based on the genetic ancestry? In, in common terminology, we use the race and ethnicity. Those two are social constructs. They do not tell us anything about our genetic makeup. So that's why in science, we tend to use the term genetic ancestry. Can answer so can answers obtained from this study be used to develop clinical trials that we have done? And then the last question, what difference exists between breast tissues of men and women? This is the most sciencey slide you are going to see. This is our study showing the, the, the different cell types in the normal breast. What we found that the cells here exist in 23 different cell states. This is the first demonstration of the cell types within the normal breast and how many different ways they can exist. What we also observed is not all of them are prone for cancer development. There are only four cell types from which the breast cancer may originate. The third point where you showed in this study is depending on the cell type from which it originated, and there are some circled here, that has a different outcome. So we can use that knowledge now to figure out maybe this particular treatment may be working on a one cell type from which the cancer originated, whereas the, if the cancer originated from the other cell type, there may be a different treatment that is needed. Those are the things which we can do it in future based on the observation we made here. So the question I raised before, why do we have to concern, uh, be concerned about genetic ancestry? Typically, when I give a talk like this, I generally give an example of our ability to tolerate spice as an example. Some of us can eat spicy food. Some of us cannot eat spicy food. But we are all normal. Those who can eat spicy food are normal, those who cannot. Same, uh, take a simple example of cilantro. Many of us enjoy cilantro in our meal, but there is a certain portion for Certain people cannot tolerate it. It feels like a soap in them because they carry a point mutation which makes them feel differently. They are normal. Those who can eat, who cannot eat, all are normal. 99.99% of our DNA are similar. But it is the remaining difference which makes us look different, our skin color different, the way we respond to a simple things like common flu different. So our goal is in the common normal tissue is to get deep into that system to figure out why this 0.01% difference in our genome makes us behave differently or respond differently or have a different incidence of breast cancer. Although we may not get in there in eventually, but we can start feeling a little bit. And the one aspect my lab is focusing on is African-American women from sub-Saharan ancestry. Sub-Saharan and sub sahara is known for malarial infection. To ward of the malarial infection millions of years ago or centuries ago, the gene got, a gene got mutated in them that is still being carried in the population from sub-Saharan ancestry. But that mutation is helping them to protect, get protected against malarial infection. But what is happening is if people with that mutation get breast cancer, that tend to be much more aggressive. The question we have been asking is, why is that? What difference exists? When we looked into the DNA of 100 African-American women who donated the breast tissue, in fact, 
Ours is the only bank to have such a high number. We have more than 900 samples from African-American women. When we did the sequencing of 100 women, 32 of them had one copy, which is similar to this protection against malaria. Whereas remaining, whereas another seven had both the copies that are as though they are protected against malaria. We have created now the cell lines from them. The, we created from four African-American women who do not carry those mutations. One which has one copy mutation, two which has both copy mutation. The lab is studying to figure out, and we have created breast cancer out of them, of these cell types in the lab. And now we are studying how they be, are they behaving differently? Do they need a different type of treatment? That's the work which is going on. We also found that the indigenous Americans carry a breast cancer protective allele. And what is shown previously by others, Latino women with the higher indigenous American ancestry are more prone for HER2 positive breast cancer. And Asian women have denser breast compared to white women. So we are trying to use that knowledge to create resources for everyone to study this, how, how we can biologically understand these differences. My fantasy world, maybe it may not be able to achieve in my lifetime, but this is something I always think about, is what we call adaptive trait. Millions of years ago, you know, we, the people never moved that much, but we uh, they get adapted to different regions. For example, here in these countries, they all adapted to marine diet. Some adapted to lactose tolerant. I pointed out the malaria resistance, cholera resistant, arsenic rich environment. If the rice and water you grow in an arsenic rich environment are enriched for this arsenic in even in the rice, but it is toxic. But the mutations have been happening in their genome so that they could adapt to that. And high altitude, for example, in uh, uh, Tibet, people have a mutation in a gene that helps them to survive in low oxygen condition. But people in this region, in though although they were there, now they are moving out. For example, Tibetans are now in Bombay where the climate is, is the sea level. Is this mutation which helped them to survive in low oxygen, if they get breast cancer, will that mutation have an effect on the can breast cancer? So these are the studies we would like to do in future, but at the moment we are focused on the gene mutation that is protecting against malaria. This particular paper made a very important point at the very end. It is critical to include diverse people in genomic studies to ensure that all people benefit from this knowledge. And KTB is a driving force in making sure that the breast tissues of women of different genetic ancestries are included in the breast cancer study so that the benefit will go to all the, all the people. So that is one of our goal we are hoping to achieve in future. So what we have done is now the, this particular manuscript is under review at the moment. We have created single cell atlas of breast tissues of women of Ashkenazi Jewish European, African, Asian, Hispanic, white, and indigenous American ancestry. We have created the resources to study the breast cells from women of Sub-Saharan Africa, ancestry carrying protective allele against ma malarial infection. And we have also, we characterized the breast epithelial cells from Latina women carrying breast cancer protective allele. The one that is leading us to a clinical trial is a study we recently published with the, Dr. Kathy Miller is starting the clinical trial. If you, I told you when you dissect out the duct, you see a layer of cells. This is how the cells in the layer of cells look like in the duct. Now surrounding this, there are these are supporting players which are there. And these brown cells are the unique cell types that we have identified. What we found that these cells are enriched in the normal breast of African-American women. They are not inert cells. They communicate very well with these cells and they dictate how these ductal cells from which the cancer originates behave. They change them. And what we have identified is a communication between these two cells, which makes the, the cancer comes from these cells to be much more aggressive. Luckily, there is a drug that has been developed. 
for the secreted factor because of this uh, communication. This is a drug sub, uh, drug being manufactured or marketed by Genentech for autoimmune disease. So the FDA approved drug is already available to block this interaction. The clinical trial Dr. Miller is starting is to see whether we can combine that drug with the common chemotherapy will they show a benefit particularly in african-american women so the study will include both white women and african-american women with this drug combination to see whether it will benefit or not so this is what has uh, the the research using the ktb tissue in the lab is now moving to the bedside bench to bedside i will briefly touch upon the what we have been doing with the men the breast cancer in men, which has been not under the radar for a long time, now it is coming under the radar. There are 2,800 cases per year in US with the 500 deaths. The numbers are increasing. 1.9 in, in 100,000 white men, 2.7 in 100,000 black men develop breast cancer. What the VA has done is a group of investigators looked into the, all the breast cancer cases in VA. They went through the charts of 150 VA hospital. There are 8,864 breast cancers. Among that, 1,500 were men. So this number does not look like same as in the general public. It looks to be much higher. When they went back and looked into the data, most of the veterans with breast cancers were Vietnam and Korean War veterans, where they were exposed to Agent Orange and burn pit. So the occupational aspect may be the one which may be responsible for breast cancer in men. So what are the differences the clinic? 95% of breast cancers in men, 70% of breast cancers in women are estrogen receptor positive. Many of you know that the breast cancer is broadly classified into estrogen receptor positive and estrogen receptor negative. Most of the estrogen receptor positive breast cancers are in pre-menopausal, sorry, post-menopausal women. They get the anti-estrogens, that's the standard of care. Anti-estrogens given to men, but they are not as effective. Then my lab is working now is why is that? What we have done is we have created the, we have generated the breast cells from men and women and compared them. What we found, and this is your biology 101. If you look into a cell, there is a cell membrane. There is a what we call cytoplasm. And then there is what we call nucleus. Most of the DNA is in the nucleus. This is the powerhouse of the cell. When these estrogen is, the cell is exposed to estrogen, it diffuses into this nucleus where it activates the estrogen receptor. This is what typically happens in the breast cells in women, in majority of the case. What we found in case of men, the same estrogen and estrogen receptor complex, not only working in the nucleus, it transmits another signal from the plasma membrane, from this membrane. So instead of generating one type of signal that's common in women, and there is two types of signal coming from the same molecule estrogen in men. So is the anti-estrogens works on this signal, but not effectively on this signal. So that's the reason why we think the anti-estrogens are not effective. About three months ago, there was a 72 year old uh, gentleman who had breast cancer. We collected the breast tissue from him. We, we grew the cells, cancer cells from out of uh, his tumor and treated them with estrogen, with and without estrogen. We just got the data day yesterday. It looks like the, the way the estrogen regulates the gene expression in men versus women are completely different, or there are new pathways in that. In addition to that, we have the new, new player about Y chromosome. You know, you must have heard as a joke that the Y chromosome has only genes for channel flipping at home all the time, right? So that's why it was considered in addition to only determining the sex, that it has no other function. It was called genetic wasteland. That concept has changed significantly recently because long for a long time, the, breast, the cancer outcome difference between men and women are thought to be only because of the sex hormones. It is no longer the case. What they, what they have found recently is overall, 
if you take the blood from man and see whether their Y chromosome is active or inactive, if there's a loss of Y chromosome in the any blood cells, that's an indication that that particular person is highly susceptible for cancer. Depending on the cancer cell type, cancer type, proteins from the Y chromosome can be a good cop or a bad cop. The example came recently in bladder cancer and colon cancer. In bladder cancer, if the Y chromosome is lost, the tumors tend to be much more aggressive, but it may be susceptible for the immunotherapy. By contrast, in colon cancer, having the Y chromosome is deleterious. So depending on the cancer type, the Y chromosome has a different role to play in man. But we don't know what role it plays in, uh, in uh, the breast cancers of men. But what we did find is the genes on Y chromosome are expressed in the breast tissues of men. However, what roles they have in breast cancer of men is unknown. It is our current pro focus. We have sent out two proposals at the moment. They are under review. If they come through, that's one of the things we are going to do. And we have already created a breast cancer model in men so which we can generate and use our animal models and the cell line models to study them in detail. So this is the background information I wanted to give you. Again, thousands of women who donated breast tissues and volunteers who facilitated the breast tissue collection, many, many thanks to them. And the leadership and staff of the Common Tissue Bank, without their spending countless number of hours, making sure that every data are collected correctly, diligently and stored and and the funders who helped us, these are the funders who have been helping us in many ways, including the Catherine Peachy Fund. Just a shout out to the Catherine Peachy Fund. 28 years ago, I started my career at IU. My first funding came from Catherine Peachy Fund. Without that initial dollars I got from them, probably I wouldn't have been speaking here today. Thank you all for your attention. Now we can start up with the discussion. Thank you, Hari. Thanks for the shout out to the Peachy Fund. We are so proud of you and so grateful for the work that you do. Thank you very, very much. Um, we've received a lot of great questions prior to today's um, presentation, and I think a number of them were answered in the presentation, but we're going to go through and I'm going to ask Hari some of these questions. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat and we'll do our best to get to as many as, as we can. Um, Hari, since you were just speaking about male breast cancer, I'm going to start there. Um, you, you noted how many, how many samples have been collected from men and some of the research that's been done. Um, I think for potential donors, there's some curiosity. Um, what are post donation complications, especially with muscles in the chest and are the medications re required? the same to cure uh, male and female breast cancer? So the complications from the donor's perspective, I myself have donated it. Okay, so mm -hmm. at, at the most, what you will see is some hematoma. If you are a exercise buff, probably, you know, I did, I only did the elliptical, I did not do any other heavy other exercise for a week. That is the only sacrifice I had to make by, by donating the tissue. And I could go out that evening when I, I donated in the morning. After that, I came to my office, I was working, absolutely no problem at all. So I'm speaking from the experience itself rather than saying theoretically, you will not have any problem. Right? So the the treatment wise for the, I, we do suspect in about a year or two, I, I told you there are two signaling coming from the estrogen in men. The second signal, there are already drugs that can be targeted for that. So we do suspect once our studies are complete with the more models and a lot more work we do, I think there is a potential to include additional FDA approved drug that will be effective against breast cancer in men. So I suspect in about three, four years, we will be able to translate what we are doing the work here into the clinical trial to see whether men can benefit from additional treatment. Yes. That's very exciting. And that's pretty speedy in the world of um, research and yeah. getting getting new drugs available. 
Um, and I will add anecdotally, Stephen Peachy Jr. Uh, was the first to donate male breast tissue. <clears throat> and he did great. I think he would encourage anyone to do it. And my dad also donated and um, had no complications. Um, so I encourage men to donate. I, I know I've done it myself and it's very personally fulfilling. I think most of us that are listening today have a real personal stake in this and it feels really good to give a part of yourself and feel like you're really making a tangible impact. Um, all right, let's see. Um, what strategies do you use to collect re to collect uh, minority breast tissue? I mean, uh, you can see based on what I pointed out, we have been already successful in doing that because out of 5,000 5, samples, 882 or more are from African-American women. That's about 20% of the samples. If you consider the African-American population here locally, it's significantly higher than the percentage of population, right? So that we have been, so we try to do several uh, recruiting minority person. First, we have to educate them why it is important to donate the tissue. And we share our research with them. It is not that you just give the tissue and walk away. We share our research and how it helps to contribute to the minority patient's treatment. For example, I gave you the example of the Duffy phenotype. Hopefully what we are doing now will help in that direction. And then we do have the people who have donated the tissue. We help, we ask them, can you help us to recruit? they get involved because culturally we are all different, right? So we try to find the community from the people from the communities who are part of the, or the donate, who are donated before. And of course, we have to make sure that culturally, the cultural difference. We do have issues with particular certain groups, but I think we can certainly be, be sensitive to their cultural aspect before we ask them and getting in, Involving the community rather than we going and just directly going is the most critical aspect in recruitment. Yeah. Great. Okay. Another question is since breast abnormality can begin as early as childhood, could research using KTB tissue donations possibly lead to detecting breast abnormalities earlier than it can currently be detected by mammograms? That is all of our ultimate goal. All the efforts of the cancer prevention, every one of us have that as a goal. And one of the area, the progress that are being made is what we call the liquid biopsy, where you can do the blood samples to figure out. The question that how the KTB will help is that if we can figure out what are the earliest lesions that lead to breast cancer, a lot of time the DNA containing the lesions are split into split into the bloodstream. So we can start detecting them very early, even before it becomes apparent in mammography. This may not happen in the next five, 10 years, but I suspect the research that are being going on now with the KTB samples will lead to that kind of testing in about 10, in about 20, 30 years. That's my hope. Great. That's phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> okay, this is a really interesting question. Would the collection on normal tissue, um, be it GYN, colon, adjacent tissue during surgeries or wellness exams, have the potential to replicate the successes achieved with the tissue available through the KTB? Can the KTB be the model for progress in other cancer sites? So the issue that is Yes, other people have approached us with the same question who are involved in the tissue banking and all. The, what KTB has shown is that the tissues that are adjacent to the tumor are not normal. So the colonoscopy, for example, is usually done if there is a risk or... So if you collect the tissue adjacent to a colon polyp as a normal, that may not be a normal. And the prostate biopsies are rarely done on a healthy man, right? Yes, the model system is very good, but how to implement it is something is going to be very difficult because most of in those most of the those cases, people some having some abnormality are the one who are going for screening purpose. Even if you take something adjacent to the normal, uh, adjacent to the tumor, that may not be a normal. 
but i think i i agree with the uh, person who has asked the question at least the other banks should start collecting at least those tissues to get better answers than what we have yeah um if you were to find breast cancer in a healthy tissue donor do, or donation would you inform the donor and has this ever happened no that's a interesting uh, question this has not happened so far to us the reason why it has not happened is because the breast tissue is collected from a one particular spot of the breast that's a very very tiny fraction of the entire breast the chances of we detecting a cancer in the re in the region we went pretty much randomly is extremely low but if it does happen then there are ways you know we're making sure that we follow all the regulatory aspects of irb to making sure that we don't violate the law there will be a way to inform the donor um here's another one what is the potential of the common tissue bank in terms of contributing to the prevention of breast cancer so i pointed out to you that it's a group from uh, mayo clinic what they are doing is to develop the prevention vaccine so the way they are trying to do is to see if somebody has a benign breast tissues, disease compared to the KTB normal tissue, are the immune cells that are entering there are different? What are they doing there? Are they being active or they're just invading but not being able to do that? If at all they're not able to remove that benign breast tissue, based on the abnormalities seen in that benign breast tissue, can we develop the vaccines to activate or make awaken this disease, the immune cells to kill that? That's an early part of the study that is going on by our collaborators from Mayo Clinic and other places. I think probably one way to do that is the prevent preventive vaccines. That's what I suspect will be the next step. Okay. Um, here's the, another interesting question. I I've, I've heard so many questions so many of these questions before and this is one i've not heard before does binary or non-binary breast tissue test differently than male or female tissue you know before the pandemic broke out we had a meeting with the surgeons who do those this thing and we were thinking of approaching the irb to start collecting those tissues for a comparison purpose but because of the pandemic afterwards we did not go through that this is something we need to test for sure and i just pointed out in my talk the y chromosome is no longer a genetic wasteland right y chromosome do produce proteins which impact the cancer progression now if someone is transitioning in one side you have the y chromosome how does it change when it encounters tons of different hormonal things so this will be a very interesting and important aspect and in my lab has the resources to generate the cells and models using those tissue. This is something we really need to think about it and uh, with the, uh, but have to go through all sorts of approval process. Once that is done, I think that we may have to go in that direction in future. Okay. And finally, when is the next Komen Tissue Bank collection? It is on November 11th. November 11th, we have the tissue collection where, I mean, you can go to the KTV website and sign it up. And then also we are looking for younger women, women of color for that. That's our goal. And there is a collection in the early morning for men. So, you know, I know one of, one of my uh, collaborator, a friend from California, he said, I'm going to fly over here to donate my breast tissue. So he's flying over to wow. donate his breast tissue because yeah, a lot of men are showing interest in this direction. It's coming up November 11th. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, um, uh, there are a few questions in the chat, I believe. Oh, I have not. Oh, okay. okay. Let's see, let's I think, see. oh, let's, let me see if I can. I wasn't seeing those. I don't see them. If, if you see them, Hari, please. Oh, okay. A new question. Since breast abnormality can begin. Okay. That you already answered. Yep, yeah. We did that one. Are you still looking for? Yes, I mean, uh, that, that we answered. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, hopefully we have answered everyone's questions. Um, thank you for joining us for this month, Simon Says, 
and you can find a recording of today's session and the information about upcoming sessions at cancer.iu.edu backslash Simon Says. Thank you.